Welcome to another edition of Teach the Geek Interviews. My name is Neil Thompson. I'm the founder of Teach the Geek. I work with technical professionals so they can present more effectively, especially in front of non-technical audiences. And you can learn more about that at teachthegeek.com. Again, that's teachthegeek.com. Today, my guest is, Je is Dan Chuparkov, and he's a former technology leader. He's a keynote speaker on the topics of innovation and the future of teams. So if you're, in, if you're an aspiring speaker, you may have some questions about how to get started, questions like how do you sell your how do you sell your speaking services how do you how do you market yourself you know questions like how do you set your prices things like that so let's get some answers from dan welcome to teach to geek interviews dan thanks so much neil uh i'm excited to be here looking forward to talking about some of this stuff with your audience especially in tech like getting getting out there into the world and speaking is sometimes really hard. We're talking about technical stuff that people don't always understand. Uh, we we all have like deep passion about specific stuff inside of us. And getting that out is, is sometimes really fun if you can find a way to do it. So uh, I'm excited to talk about that journey with you today. Wonderful. So when it comes to the, the speaking topic that you speak on, Dan, how did you come to that topic? I think you know, first it took a long time. Like I, I, my first big speech that I did at a Gartner conference was back in 2011. And it was just a random thing. Like my, my team, I'll tell you more about that story. I, I, I it was not my passion. It was just a project that we were working on and we wanted to share it. Um, now, 13 years later, now I've spent a lot of time thinking like if I write a book, and somebody buys that book 15 years from now or 20 years from now, what do I want that book to say? Like, what do, what do I want to be remembered for? And that's a way harder question. Uh, and so I, I've literally spent about eight years figuring out what makes me unique about a particular topic in the world. And, and what I realized is because of the exact age that I am, I started, which is 54 at the time of this recording. Um, I started working on a team before we had PCs and our team got PCs. And then five years later, we got the internet. Five years after that, we got the mobile, mobile phones in our pocket. And then we got cloud and then we got data science and then we got remote teams. And now we have AI. Those seven transitions completely changed the way we managed information. And I've been helping my team since those very beginning days figure out how to tackle massive new technology changes. Um, and that's that's what I've been doing for 35 years. And so that's what my book is about. That's what my speeches are about. And I'm just helping people like tackle big changes. All right. So let's say there's a person list or people listening to this conversation and they're aspiring to be professional speakers, they've now come to their speaking topic. What types mm. of like, assets do they need to have to really push, put themselves out there as professional speakers? I think the, the first thing is you need some experience, right? You have to get on some stages and talk to people about stuff that you're intelligent about. And so, you know, first start applying to speak at conferences. Um, you know, there are conferences in every segment of the industry uh, there are things like Toastmasters and, and things that you and your audiences are familiar with, but just getting out in front of audiences and building some experience and practice is the first most important thing. When you get up there, you got to have confidence that you know what you're saying. You're not making it up as you go. You've got, you know, a very specific structure to the way you're talking. And then you start capturing some of that stuff on video. And you you start assembling video of you speaking in front of crowds. And the first thing somebody wants to know when they're about to book you is, do you have any video that shows how good you are at this? Uh, and so those that's the those are the first two places to start. Practice and video of you practicing. All right. We get some. OK, now you have a topic. Or have you done some speaking engagements? You've gotten some video. But but. Really, to, to really push yourself out there as a professional speaker, how would you suggest people market themselves? I think the 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 channel for me that works best is definitely LinkedIn. Um, the people that are running conferences, the people that are trying to get people to register for their conferences are often talking about this stuff on LinkedIn. And so... 
building building a LinkedIn community, getting some regular experience talking about what you do on LinkedIn is is definitely the channel that works best for me. Um, but just talking about what you do, talking about your expertise doesn't get you booked, right? It helps, right? It, it definitely helps people to see that you're, that you exist. Um, but then there's a whole other angle here where you have to start finding people that have budget to book speakers. Um, and you know, that's a, that's a different, that's a different problem. <laughs> um, and so figuring out wh who are the associations that have paid member gatherings, uh, who are the, who are the places that you could reach out to that might need a, a paid speaker periodically. The, the association of photographers has an annual meeting and they all come together and they want speakers that talk about how photography is changing, how digital cameras are evolving, how, how AI might edit people's photos automatically. Those people have an annual meeting and they pay speakers to come there. And there's an association for everything. And so finding the leaders of those organizations, reaching out to them and selling yourself as a speaker to them, that's the that's the next part. And that that takes a lot of practice. Finding those people is hard. Figuring out what to say to them to sell yourself in one email, that's hard too. And so um, that, but that's the next step and it's an important part. Yep, you're absolutely right. It is the the important part, finding these decision makers who has budget. You're absolutely right. So when it comes to even how would you even tackle that part, just even for your own business, how do you go about finding those decision makers and, and, and finding those engagements? I think, you know, the first part is stick to a, a sector of the industry that you know personally that you've worked in like the 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 two places that i went first when i wanted to start building myself as a as a speaker was first south by southwest i i had been going to south by southwest for you know 15 years i know that conference intimately i know what kind of stuff works well there and what stuff doesn't and so you know i started trying to speak there now, South by Southwest doesn't pay most of us uh, as speakers. That it's a it's a free thing. But when you deliver a great talk there, there's people in your audience that see your talk and say, "Wow, the rest of my team need to hear that." And then they'll come up to you after you get off stage and they'll say, "Hey, do you do this for companies?" And you will say, "Yes," but it, unfortunately, there's a fee. And you know that's how that's how you start getting business. Um, do some talks and then then get that good at at what we call stage side leads people that come up to you after you know figure out exactly what you're going to say to them um even if they don't ask right you might say hey you know i i appreciate you coming up it's great i do this as a living it's my full-time job so if you ever have an opportunity where you need a speaker like me to come and talk to your team or your team's customers, I'm available. And that's, uh, that's how you start getting gigs. All right. So, I get the sense that for not only just aspiring speakers, but for experienced speakers alike to get, a, I guess a number of, a, to get a number of gigs or a number of speaking engagements so that it's sustainable. So you can continue to be a full-time speaker. You have to do some outreach. So when you reach out to, to various entities, reach out to the various decision makers, you may not get a response right away. How do you handle following up with, with people? I think, so I, I'm not, I'm not a salesperson, And so I have a different strategy for this than, than a lot of people will. Um, most of the time when you reach out to a speaker, I'm sorry, most of the time when you reach out to an event planner, they don't have an event right now that they're trying to book a speaker for they they might have just finished their event their their next event might not be for 11 and a half months right even some speakers right after the event happens they immediately book the one for 12 months in the future and so they don't need a speaker for 23 more months so i i, I really i don't follow up I reach out one time, maybe I, I try to make sure we're connected on LinkedIn so that they see that I exist. I'm not going to send them 
nine messages or 13 messages um, like some sales books will say to do um, because timing of events is the most important factor and you have no idea what that is. Um, And so I'll, I'll maybe send one message and then annually I'll send a message to all the people that I didn't hear from again. Um, But I I don't ever send more than two outreaches a year um, to the same person. Oh, okay. Okay. That's interesting. So in the event that you don't hear back after that second outreach, is it just a a, a dead, a dead, I guess a dead plan to to move, try to move forward with that particular organization? Um, well, well, first of all, if you know, if you know, they pay speakers and you know, this is the right person and you know, you're the right fit for that audience, then possibly there's a way to engage with these people more. Um, but usually you don't know <laughs> that they pay speakers and you don't know that they're the right person. Right. And, and so constantly like harassing people it doesn't doesn't help you there's 329 million other people in the u.s alone that might pay you to speak there and so like reach out and do a a a reasonable amount of follow-ups that feels good and comfortable to you do the amount of follow-ups that you would want to receive as a person being sold to um and for me that's a very small number But, and then, and then move on. Like these people know who you are, make sure you're connected in some social channel. If that's LinkedIn for you or Instagram or, or, or X, they will see that you exist and keep publishing content and be interesting in the world. And they they will find you, 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 you don't have to, you don't have to keep selling. You do have to reach out so that they know that you exist and you, that you have a product that might be a good fit for them. But um, I would go broad as opposed to going repetitively. That That's my sales strategy, and that's not everyone's. I'm not a great sales guy. I never did sales for my job. So other people would definitely have different answers to that. For those who respond to call for proposals, and in a lot of cases, you don't know whether those are paid or, or paid engagements or not. At what point do you figure out or ask whether it's a paid engagement? Um. First, get them interested in you, right? So first, first get interest. Like you fill out the call for speakers thing. Um, you get them to reach out to you, saying, "Hey, you filled out this thing, and that would be great for our conference." And then you say, "Hey, I'm a paid speaker. Do you have budget for your keynote, or for your keynote and your closing keynote? Because um, I would really like to be considered for one of those spots." That's how I do the call for speakers proposal flipping. Um, usually paid speakers at, at some threshold of money. I don't know. I don't know what that threshold might be. 4,000, 5,000, 7,500. They're not doing call for speakers for the paid speakers, right? They're going through other channels. They're finding other speakers through speaker bureaus or you know speaker managers and and stuff like that so you you have a fairly low chance at converting a call for speaker proposal into a paid gig but it but it is possible that definitely all right so now you have an aspiring speaker they have Mm -hmm. a topic they have they have maybe a few they they have the, the 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 collateral they have the confidence to reach out to the various decision makers to to see whether whatever they speak on is of interest to them so now we get to the money mm. how do you determine how to price your services dan i think you you should know who you're competing against so look you got to look at the speaker world and see who are the speakers out there that are talking on the same topic as you have similar background or experience as you and figure out what they're, what they're paying, right. What, what they're getting paid. Like I have, you know, in, in front of me on the, uh, on my, on my screen, I have, sorry, green screen is messing up my ability to show you. Uh, I have number, I have four names, written in front of me all the time of speakers that I'm competing against. 
and I know what their fees are because I Google, you know, Crystal Washington keynote speaker fee, and I get to see what her range is. And so if I'm genuinely as good as Crystal, which I'm actually not, she's she's amazing, um, then that gives me an understanding of what what fee I could potentially charge. Um and that's that's how you do that. You you've got to figure out who are the other speakers that are getting that money. How do you even go about figuring out what services to even offer? Because I, I get the sense when people hear professional speaker, they think keynote, but you there's other things that potentially speakers can do. So how how do you how would you advise an aspiring speaker go about figuring out the services they provide? I I think um everyone's different there about like what they want this business to look like um i i i like the speaking stuff i like standing on a stage and activating an audience with some new ideas and getting smiles and laughs that's that's the fun part for me um other people like to do a two or three day workshop right they they would rather they would rather get really deep and help lead exercises with their audience, um, you know, help really unpack some concepts to make maybe longer lasting changes instead of just a single light bulb. Um, and so you've got to decide as a speaker, like which side of those is more fun for you. Do you want, do you want 125 one hour speeches in a year, or do you want 35 three day workshops in a year? which of those would be more fun for you. Um, and if you're going to do a workshop, can you carry a room by yourself for three days or do you need some assistance? Um, those, those are hard questions. And then other people turn it into like the one-on-one -on -one coaching or, uh, you know, community management stuff where you join my community for $99 and I'll keep giving you more, uh, more content every, every week. Those, those are all versions of speaking, um, in the world. And, and I, there's a mix, like I, I, there's no, I know a lot of speakers and every one of them has a slightly different combination of those things that they offer their customers. For people who are aspiring to be professional speakers, I mean, you mentioned how you weren't, you're not the best salesperson. And I suspect that a lot of other aspiring or people who are aspiring to be speakers, they may think they may not think of themselves as the best salespeople either. So they think a way to get around that perhaps is to engage with speaker bureaus so they could do the selling for them. What are your thoughts on aspiring speakers looking for speaker bureaus to to advocate and advertise for them? So I think that a lot of people are very confused about what speaker bureaus do. Um, first, uh, Speaker bureau. So I'm new in my relationship with some new speaker bureaus. I have a couple that are representing me now. And what happens is they join my sales call with me and listen. That's what they do. Um, I have to get, I have to get interest. I have to figure out what I'm saying to sell myself. I have to win the gig there there for support um now what really happens is after i sell them and they're about to sign that deal the client will call that salesperson or that speaker bureau and say look fifteen thousand dollars is a lot of money if i do this i need to i need i need you to promise me that this is going to be okay and they will say don't worry i've seen dan six times his clients love him it's going to be okay that's what speaker bureaus do. They're there to say it's going to be okay. They're not salespeople. They're not going out to a hundred people and trying to sell you. They, they might occasionally put you on a proposal of five people when one of their clients asks for an innovation speaker that used to work at Google. Like I might end up in proposals, but they're, but they're very much not speaker salespeople. Uh, and a lot of people are confused about that. Yeah, I I, I think so, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So it, it, it sounds like you still have to do quite a bit of the legwork. It's just that the, the speaker bureau is almost like a third party being able to vouch for you, you as, a, as, a, as a speaker. 
Yeah, that's that's definitely it, that's definitely true, and it and it gets more important as your fee gets higher. You know, if if somebody's about to spend thirty five thousand dollars on a speaker like Josh Linkner, thirty five thousand is a lot of money. They don't know Josh; they've seen some of his videos, but like they're tiny clips. You can't tell if that hour long talk is going to be great from a three minute, you know, heavily published um, speaker reel. And so they, you know, as your fee gets high, that 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 bureau handholding is is important. But whatever your fee is, bureaus want to they want to see you selling yourself first because they they don't know you well enough to sell you. They they just won't. They have hundreds of speakers that they represent. They can't dig into the weeds and sell you. They'll they'll maybe get occasional calls for you to come and sell yourself. But um, but yeah, most people are very uh, have misunderstood that. And so my main my main message here is you've got to figure out how to sell yourself first, and then after that's going well and you have some momentum, bringing in a, a bureau to help you accelerate that process a little bit is is worth worth doing but most people try to do that way too early those who are aspiring speakers dan they may think of investing in a speaker program that will help them accelerate their business what do you, what are your thoughts on on speaker programs and what can people i guess reasonably expect from such programs um i think there are there are a number of those programs out there. I have participated in two of them. Uh, I don't want to, I don't want to appear biased in any way. So I, I won't tell you those two programs, but uh, two programs run by separate organizations. One focuses a little bit more on the performance of speaking. Like, what am I doing with my hands? What am I doing on stage? Where am I standing? How loud is my voice? Do I go like this when I mean, when I say the words, everyone, those are, you know, the, the stage craft is an important part of the business. And I went to a program that helped me with some of that. They also helped me write the speech itself, um, which was uh, moderately helpful for me to figure out how to create a story arc. Those things are super helpful and they elevate your delivery um, for sure. The other program that I've been part of uh, has been uh, also very helpful. That program is more about the business of speaking. Like, what, is, what does it mean to be a full-time professional speaker? How, how many of these can I actually do? Um, you know, is it is it 25? Um, is it 150? You know, that that's a hard question to know. Like what at what point does my travel logistics become impossible? Um, and and you know, th this other program that I joined dug into that stuff. They taught me about what speaker bureaus actually do. I met some of them. Um, you know, those are the things that helped me a lot. If you really want to do this as a full-time thing, if you want to be a great speaker. Don't try to do it by yourself. Um, you'll you'll um, you'll need some help. Um, and so there are a lot of different speaker coaching things that help you in a bunch of different ways. Uh, I would recommend dabbling with some of those because they will elevate your game if you really want to do this for real. All right. If you're an aspiring speaker and your and your dream one day is to become a full time speaker. What do you need to have in place before you quit your job to become a full-time speaker? Um, so I did that last September, last September 1st, 2023. I quit my job at Google. I was doing well. I was a leader at Google. I got 30 years of experience. Um, I decided to get rid of the health insurance and a full-time paycheck and stock in order to do this. And the threshold for me was... I had more paid speeches than I had vacation days. I could not, I was already selling the speech. And in September, I had four paid speeches last year. And I couldn't do that while still working at Google because I was running out of vacation days. The travel time was going to be too much. If I took the whole month of September off from Google to prep for those things, I was either going to screw up my job at Google or I was going to screw up those speeches. And so get demand. 
first, right? Prove to yourself that people want to buy this from you at a level that makes quitting make sense. Um, and, you know, I told you the dates here. My first real speech was in 2011 and I quit in 2013. So I spent, or 2023. So I spent 12 years prepping for that moment, right? I've practiced my speech probably 2000 times. Um, so, you know, it, it, the, the, if you want to be great, um, and by great, I mean, there's probably, there's probably 10,000 speakers in the world that make more than $10,000 per speech. And there's hundreds of thousands of people that are speaking, uh, maybe millions. And so, you know, if you, if you want to be great enough to get 150,000, 250,000 or more to speak, uh, it, it, you know, it takes, takes a, a long time. Um, but it's worth it in the end. I have the best job in the world now. I've never been happier in my life. I get to control my own, um, uh, time. I get to focus on what I want to focus on. I get to get my messages that have been brewing inside me for 50 years. I get them out into the world and that's the best job in the world. Nice. Well, well this has been a great conversation. Thank you so much for, for speaking with me with speaking with me today, Dan, how can people get in touch with you? Um, I'm pretty easy to find on the internet. The Chu Park Off, C-H-U-P-A-R-K-O-F-F is my last name. There's only like 25 of us in the country. They're all my cousins and I'm best at search engine optimization. So I'll be at the top of the Google list. Uh, connect with me on LinkedIn, reach out through my website. You can email me uh, and I, I'm happy to support speakers on their journey uh, to help share things I've learned because that's what I'm trying to do as a speaker. So I might as well help other speakers too. Wonderful. Well, everyone, that marks the end of another edition of Teach the Geek interviews. My name is Neil Thompson. I'm the founder of Teach the Geek. I work with technical professionals so they can present more effectively, especially in front of non-technical audiences. And you can learn more about that at teachthegeek.com. Again, that's teachthegeek.com. Until next time, take care and stay safe. Thanks, Dan. Thanks so much for having me, Neil.